So much in eyes, my lamp is so much in eyes, my lamp is so much in eyes, my lamp is so much in eyes. Don't forget to buy a month. Hi, thanks for watching the podcast today, or listening, or how are you consuming it? Uh, let's have a word from our sponsors, Wuka. Uh, original designs only. This is the Dragon Egg. This is awesome. It's basically an electronic dab rig. Um, and if you're going to take electronic dab rig advice, you should ask somebody who lives in a bus like me. Obviously. So get this. Link in the description. Thanks for watching or listening to the show. However, you consume it. Thank you. Hey, it's about time we had this conversation. If you want a beard like this, or close to this, or even half as good, Use luxurious bastard beard oil. Promo code legendary for a discount. And step your game up. Oh, hey. Howdy. Hey, how you doing, man? I'm good. How are you, dude? Dude, yeah, doing decent, man. I, I want to I wanna address something before we have this absolute legend on. We have, like, in a second, we're going to have a legendary guy, six Emmys. I mean, you're going to hear more about him. But I want to tell you. But I want to tell you something real fast. Like, some some crackhead broke into my bus earlier, and I want to call him out right now. I feel I feel like he should be called out. He probably watches the show like everybody else. And uh, I, just, <laughs> I was going to say a crackhead broke into my bus and took a wallet, and he and he bought he bought Wendy's with with my with a debit card. He bought he bought that's he robbed me and committed a sin to buy Wendy's. That's like what he did. That's how smart this guy is. And I just want to say like we're going to catch him. We're going to catch you. If you're watching this, and uh, yeah, that's all I'm going to say. I'm still mad about that, but uh, that's an infuriating thing, dude. Did, did he? And he got your car too, right? Well, he got, yeah, he took my wife's car, and then, and then I'm like, I'm like, hey, only I drive my wife's car and use her money to buy Wendy's, okay? You know, it's like, <laughs> I'm just joking. But anyway, <laughs> let's take the focus off negativity. We have we have an absolute legend here. Like, I mean, this guy has worked on your your music, which is like awesome. He's worked on several bands, uh, like uh, harder bands like Anthrax, El Nino, stuff like that. Uh, Works with some like some guys I really respect. His name's uh, Eddie Wool. How you doing, brother? How are you? You're good, man. What's up, Eddie? Dude, dude it was What's so up, hard bro? not to ask you like 25 questions as soon as you came on the screen like earlier before the show. Like, I, I just want to be like, so you worked with Robbie Krieger from the Doors though too? Mm-hmm. Yeah, he cool. he guessed it on the Fuel record. It's really cool because I, I recorded Robbie in his house. That's and amazing. What's really funny is that um, he lived up in the hills, and I was afraid I was going to get lost. When I was getting there, so I le- I got there like 15 minutes early to make sure I wasn't late because I, I didn't have a trouble finding it. And he must have seen me in a camera, so he walked. He called down an intercom. He's like, "Oh, dude, you can come up." So I went up <laughs> to his house before anybody else got there. So it was just me and Robbie Krieger at his house. So he like, gave so me a tour cool. of his like old cars and gave me a tour of his house and inside and out. It's funny because I'm walking through his kitchen and he has like a doors like a Fillmore East poster, like the metal ones, like hanging in his kitchen. You're looking at those things like, oh, my God, that's like that's you on the, you know. And then he showed me he had a swimming pool that like a little swimming pool. They put sand in and he put a, a AstroTurf and a, a golf hole and he practiced chipping sand, chipping out of his old swimming pool. He made it into a sand trap. And that was really cool. So I'm in the studio with him and he's like, oh, yeah. You know, uh, th- you know, I got this guitar. I, th- I think it was with Jimmy when I bought it. And you're like, you're talking about Jim Morrison, like in the first person. But he was actually talking about Jimi Hendrix at that time. <laughs> this is crazy. Like, he's talking about these, these people like his friends, you know? Like, oh, yeah, I remember I used to go to that restaurant with Jim. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. Like, which one, Morrison or Hendrix? And then, and then the last thing that was really funny is that, so he had played, he's playing a guitar solo on the record, right? And he played like six or seven solos before I even got there just to warm up. So when we sat down, when Brett got there, the singer from Fuel, we we're like, okay, let's listen to what you got. So he plays these six solos. One of them was like 90% done. So I was like, well, let's just punch into this. Let's punch into that. We took a bunch of takes. He punched into the things and it was done, right? So guitar tone was really cool, but like a little weird. So I was like, 
he, I was like, let me see. I want to see what you're micing up your amp with. Like, let me see what you're using, right? So we had a little Fender Champ in a bathroom that was being converted into like an ISO booth, but it wasn't done yet. And I walk in there and you know how like when you go play a live show and they have the amp and the microphone cable is going through the amp and the top of the amp is holding the cable in place. We're somewhere along the line. It must have slipped off and he had shag carpet. So it's an SM58 planted in the carpet with the speaker over here. And that's what we recorded the guitar solo with. So that's what that's what made the record, huh? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't gonna look at I, you know, I looked at them like I wasn't gonna have them take it over again. It's just like, hey, that's that's the sound. We made it work. There you go, dude. Accidents. Yep, it was pretty crazy though. The mic just been in the shag car. That's one of my like, favorite guitar players probably of all time. Oh, he's great. He's great to work with too. He's so like easy, like to be like, hey dude, could you could you grab another one? Like there's one note in there, it's a little weird. Oh yeah, no problem. I'll do it as many times as you want. Like he's like one of those guys. How old is he now? He's gotta be he had to be about there. 70 when I was there, close to it. Yeah. I mean, I was with him recording like the day before um, or maybe a week before Ray died because Brett and Robbie were talking about Ray. They were like, oh, did you, have you talked to him? I don't think he's doing too well. Oh, I should really give him a call type of thing. And like a week later, he passed away. Crazy. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun experience. So that was That was a really fun experience, like. Just sitting with a Dude, I bet. straight up, straight up legend, you know. Just like no, yeah, take it over again. I figured you'd you'd be a great guest because man, I mean, you have so many stories. You know, you've had such I a do, career, yeah. so many stories, and I mean, we've worked together so much. I've I've heard a bunch of them, but uh, you know, they're right for something like this. <laughs> <laughs> um. So what have you been up to lately, man? I, I heard that you got a new band with uh, with Brett that you guys are about to release. Yeah, Brett Brett, and uh, my buddy Billy Harvey. We started writing a record just to like license it, just like all these projects start, like we're all fire brigade, you know, just yeah. a fun thing. And we started recording like we had no direction. We're like, whatever it sounds like, it sounds like, who cares? And um, we started writing at first, like these like Johnny Cash, like storyteller songs. And Brett's singing like two octaves lower than you've ever heard him sing. Like, like literally in that Johnny Cash range, because he comes right. from that world. I mean, he grew up in Tennessee. I mean, it's not it's who he is, you know. So he wrote a bunch of songs at that. Plus, Billy is really a blues guitar player. Right. You know, so we wrote these super bluesy, like storyteller songs. And every once in a while, a rock song will come out. So. uh we ended up deciding that we we're going to make two different records. One was called Desert and one's called Concrete. And Desert is all like stoner, Americana, like if you can imagine the combination. And then the rock side is more like um, like classic rock. But that's just what we wrote. And then uh, we ended up getting a record deal on uh, the whole record. And, you know, we've been just waiting for the right timing and we put it out. It's called Melody awesome. Brothers. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm looking forward to hearing that, man. It, it, it's funny because that's like you said, that's how the, the whole world for World Fire Brigade record came about as well. We we're yeah, we made this record to uh, to pitch or, or try to get placements with. And we ended up just releasing ourselves, you know. Yeah, that was a fun record. That was a really good time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Lots of lots of fun times. It's a shame that, you know, at this point, the record is so inaccessible for people. But uh, I, I, I still bump into people, you know, we'll, we'll be on tour in random places and kids will come up to me at the merch table with a World Fire Brigade record, want me to sign it. So it, it got out there a little bit, but then it's just nowhere to be consumed digitally and, and, and really hard to find on, in physically. No, know? but um, I might have a way of, of us getting the record back. That would be awesome. I mean, you know the whole story. I mean, somebody, when we did the record deal, they they... We only licensed that record to them. They didn't have the right to own the masters. They don't, we own the masters. But whoever right. registered it pretended like they own the masters. Like they got mixed up. So now if we try to get our masters, it says we don't own them. And then our lawyer that did the deal, unfortunately, passed away. Yeah. So now, like he, you know, we, we have to either hire a lawyer or... I know somebody who might know the president of that record label, see if they can just release it to us so we could put it out 
or potentially I think I could remix it so it's a different algorithm and maybe we can because we do own the record morally we own the record we never they just had the, the right to sell the record yeah yeah absolutely but you know try explaining that to, to Spotify yeah no exactly it's it's uh it's blocked so ho hopefully something can be done about it that's a good idea actually remixing it you know just th at that point it would be a new recording to the to the algorithms yeah yeah add like a keyboard part or a background vocal or something that's a whole different song absolutely dude so i see you're wearing a limelight shirt is that the club i am what's that is that's from the club right yeah this is one of my limelight shirts when i used to work there you should tell it can, can you tell us the story of how you kind of came up and and working at the limelight and how all that progressed into uh the career you have now well yeah i mean so you know i was in bands in the new york club scene i grew up in new york and then uh i was just really good friends with like one of the biggest promoters in new york and we used to go bowling all the time. And one day in passing, he was like, dude, we got to fire the door, the doorman at the limelight. They're doing a bad job. I'm like, well, I'll do it. They're like, nah, you can't do that job. I was like, yeah. So they gave me the job out front. I did the VIP, I did the front door of the limelight for about six months. And they're like, oh, the girl that's doing the <laughs> VIP room is actually charging people to get in the VIP room. She's like out and out just taking money to get in. So uh, they were like, uh, he was like, you want to work the door? And I was like, well, it's warmer. It's inside. So I started doing the rope of the VIP room. I ended up doing that for four years on Rock and Roll Church Sunday nights, which is was the night at Limelight. Worked, you know, Guns N' Roses, Pearl Jam. I mean, Rage Against the Machine. I mean, you name it. I, I did the Sunday night rope for literally years. And that was that club over the course of a night would have like 10,000 people in and out of it. And you could only fit like 300 people in the VIP room. And that's where everybody wants to be. Right. So like people would come up to me and threaten me. I mean, just crazy. I, I, I hear some people like, oh, we drove six hours to get here. And it's our dream to go in the VIP room. And you're going to ruin our night. And I'm like, sorry, dude, can't let you in. <laughs> Your dreams to go in a VIP room. Like what a, what a terrible and little dream. <laughs> <laughs> Like not to knock the room, but I mean, you should have bigger dreams, and you know, they actually, you know, they they aren't shooting for the stars at that point, but it was a cool scene, right? Well, the, the yeah, VIP was room wasn't just—I mean, yes, it was all full of celebrities, it was full of the regulars, but it also was the library because you know, Limelight was a church, and that was the library, so it was like a cool, vibey room anyway. And sometimes people just want to get into a room that they can't get into. It doesn't even matter yeah, what's in the room. for sure, especially yeah. in New York. So, 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 so then how did that, how did, how did you progress that into actually producing bands and, and turn that into the career that, that you've developed? Well, the limelight was just a part of it. I mean, I, I was in bands at the time. That's when I, I had just gotten dropped from CBS and my band Melidian, which was on MTV all the time back in my hair metal band. Oh, that that's right. That's right. What do you play? And then, well, in that band, I played keyboards, but then Ooh. I, we started like more of like a grungy rock band <laughs> that ended up being called, uh, called Red Belly. We got signed to Electra, and I was working at Limelight because that was like the best job I could have and still be in a rock band, you know. And they didn't let people pay, they didn't let people hand out passes at Limelight about some other clubs, but they let me do it. So I used to tell people like, if you don't come see my band play, I'll never let you in the VIP room ever again. So we had a really good draw in New York. We draw like five, six, seven hundred people as an unsigned band. Nice, bro. Nice. And everybody would come in the in the club when we're playing and make sure that I saw them. Like, yo, dude, yeah, I made it. I made it. <laughs> I'll make sure that. And that's when I met like Laz and Shivari. Like the guys from El Nino I actually met them when I worked at Limelight. Christian used to come to Limelight. So I knew them. I used to know Laz really well, the bass player in El Nino. He was in a band called Broomhelda back then. So I was in bands but then when red belly got signed to electra we went on tour i had to give up my job at limelight but the new york club scene working in all the clubs i worked at rocketeria I, I worked like everywhere but that was just a means to an end of getting a record deal and then and our people would be like man your demo sounds really good who did your demos i'd be like i did them myself and then my band that got signed to electra terry data reached out and said dude we don't need to re-record your record i want to mix your demos and they were home eight tracks. And I was like, oh, I'm too insecure to release my home eight tracks. So we ended up 
making a record at London Bridge in Seattle with Kelly Gray, who produced Candlebox at the time, and then played in that band, and then that band broke up, and I started another band called Vibrant Soul, got signed to Island, and at that point, I produced Primer 55 right at the same time. I was getting my own deal on Island. They were getting a deal on Island. And then the band thing never, I, I got lots of record deals, but it never really worked out for me. So, but the producing thing started to happen. So I, I went that direction in life and I did that for a long time. And then the whole music business sort of drowned. So I got into licensing and that's why I started doing music for television, which is my main thing now. I scored some shows on Discovery Plus, uh, Oxygen, Nat Geo, scored the picture, um, all the library stuff. Yeah. Lots of impressive stuff. Shit, we, we even landed together a, a spot in uh, the Super Bowl one year, right? We did. I, I've had a few of them, but I, I know you and I had at least one. I don't know how many we've had. I think it was just one with me, but that was a pretty, pretty cool thing to do. Oh, totally. We have lots of placements together. I always see like a royalty check and see some kind of... We did those Elvis-sounding songs. Remember those? Yeah. It's like rock a baby or something i don't know what the hell they were called but i see those from elvis cribs whatever the show is i see those yeah. come up on royal and checks all the time yeah it, it's it's badass back when eddie and i were uh were working on smile projects constantly i was working with him on the side on, on all these different licensing things too and and it was uh it was, it was good times and we landed a lot of cool stuff and and uh spent a lot of time hanging out over at your place yep a lot that's for sure. Playing with so, the kids. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I remember uh, making the consciousness record. I think Jack was like one something or two maybe. But I remember some of those tracks that I'm playing playing on guitar, I was like fighting Jack off with my foot like at the same time. That. He was like trying to attack the guitar and shit. And Jack is Jack is 16 now. Yeah, that's that's nuts. He actually just flew a plane. He wants to be a pilot, so he just went up in a plane. But I remember Ryan would hold Jack up in the air, and and uh, Jake <laughs> would throw his blanket over his head while you were playing guitar. And Jack thought that was the funniest thing in the world that the blanket go fly across the room and land on his head, and you'd be playing guitar track while that's all going on. Any With anything to keep him pacified, you know. We had the little playpen right in the middle of the studio. Yeah, yeah. We literally made we literally made that record with like a baby the whole time. Well, that's why I ended up calling my my studio Babyland because one time Rob Caggiano came over to my house and he saw the he saw the crib in the middle. He's like, "What what what do you got going on here? We got Babyland over here." I was like, "That's a good name. I like that." Yeah, and I I think Jack got uh some some studio credits on on my records too. I think he's studio manager. I think you credited him. Yeah, yeah, he's got some good credits going on for him, dude. Yeah. So he wants he wants to be a pilot, huh? Yeah, he's he's took his first flight introduction, but you know he has so much time on his own um, flight simulator, which is actually the same one that they had at the place, that he didn't have to go through the hour training. They put him right in the Cessna with the with the instructor, and he, you know, they have it so like either one of them can take control at any time but he right. basically took off by himself the instructor was on the radio and stuff took off they flew to santa monica and back and jack landed the plane like 90 percent himself wow so he's like flying the thing that's crazy dude and they asked me if i <laughs> wanted to go off but dude it's like two seats and then like a little coffin in the back that's like like i don't know a foot wide to a v and i'm like nah i'll, I'll stay on the ground I, I would be with you on that one, dude. I'm not going up there. No, and Jack was like, what are you scared of me flying? I'm like, well, sort of, but more claustrophobic just getting in the plane. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not I'm not trying to fly any more than I have to anyway, let alone in that kind of a situation. Yeah, he loved he loved it though. He, That's awesome. He's, yeah, he want you know the pilot's an interesting job because you can you can get a pilot's license and fly like little you know, puddle jumper type of things for tourists, or you can draw, you can be a private jet pilot, or you can go into the military. You can fly for like FedEx and fly packages, or you can fly people, you know? Right. 
there's a lot of options. Like they really need pilots now and it's a good paying job. That's I would imagine so, man. That seems like a good career choice. Yeah, so this summer but, by the time he graduates high school, he's probably gonna have the first his single engine pilot's license. Then you gotta go for the like the jet. Like this different like you gotta go up the ladder, you know, get certifications. Right. But he'll be flying before he's driving. Wow, that's crazy. He doesn't even have a driver's license, he's already flown a plane. That's crazy. De- definitely a better career choice than music these days, too. Anything's a better career choice than music. I know. I Tell me about it. Anyone. Yeah. Yeah, my daughter's my daughter's all into piano. She's she's six, but piano's one of her favorite things. And uh she's excelling at it for six, you know, but Definitely would like her to do something different for a career. Yeah, that's what I tell my kid. I said, be a lawyer or a doctor that like goes and plays in the cover band on the weekend. Like that, that'd be fun. Absolutely. Enjoy the music. Yeah, have have fun doing it, man. It's a great it's a great thing, but especially man, AI and everything, like I don't know where that's gonna be in is actually recording music ten years from now. Dude, right? I mean the the fact that you could just plug in specifics of you know recreate a, a song by this band and it'll just pop a song out finished it's it's a little scary you could be like you could be like write a song about two cats in the style of journey and you literally have a complete song in like a minute yeah yeah <laughs> where where do you see that going for for artists and and producers and such I think people are going to fight it right now. If you listen to what the music is, it's not exactly perfect. Like it'd be good ideas. Like you could make the song really cool from the lyrics, but it right. doesn't really have any heart or soul right now. Yeah. But 10 years from now, I mean, who would Yeah, it seems like only a matter of time before they get that, before they figure out a way to, to manufacture the heart and soul, you know? I mean, in the mid nineties, when I had a cell phone, it was like, ten dollars a minute and the thing looked like a brick and like you didn't want you don't want to use it you know unless it was a horrible emergency and look look at this now yeah yeah it's it's moving quickly how's that you know how's that food couch guy no here's what's weird is mike's muted and i still hear eating noises me too (laughs) it's like creepy like that's like that's what we cody and i were talking about in the chat we're like like literally, there's eating noises, but his mic's been muted for like the entire time. It's it's clearly not muted. <laughs> it's that's what that's what's weird. I don't understand it. Maybe we got a producer on here. Maybe he understands. I don't. I don't know how electronics work. But you're an idiot, not a producer, you know. So, but <laughs> it's, but it, it's, it sounds like he's eating gl- the glass that he was chewing on a second ago. It's like, no. Nah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's weird. Yeah. going back and forth. That's weird. Yeah, I, just, I don't know what it is, bro. Man. So, Eddie, for for people listening, uh, what what are some of the bands that you produced over the years once you started rolling with the production thing? Uh, Anthrax, uh, Smile Empty Soul, Fuel, El Nino, Thirty Six Crazy Fist, Primer Fifty Five, Dry Kill Logic, Life Once Lost, Agony Scene, H Two O, Jesse Mallon. Uh, I'm working with this band Versus right now. It's pretty amazing. Right um, now? Yeah, I'm I'm doing like I'm like doing Zoom pre-production with them. Right. Um. The, the it's gonna be amazing. Um. That awesome. You know, working on that. Uh, who who else am I for? I I don't even know. I I forget at this point. A long time. Yeah, a, Every yeah. once in a while, I'll, I'll go on old music and be like, "Oh yeah, I remember that record." But nice. I mean, Sean, you know, it's like, I guess it, it's something to be said. Like usually, when I work with a band, I don't just make one record for them; I make like twenty records for them. So yeah. like El Nino, I've made every single thing they've ever done be, besides the second record. But how many records did I make for you, Sean? Six. At least, yeah. At least, so like, I mean. Between uh, uh, Smile Records and Solo Records, I mean, there's there's probably close to 10. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it's like, 
even if I don't work with a new band, I'm still working with old bands. <laughs> yeah. Do you still do you still enjoy doing the rock band thing, even though your your bread and butter has now become TV and and licensing and movies and stuff like that? For the for the right artists, for artists I've worked with, like I still love working with you. I still like work working with El Nino. You know, um, for the right artists, I like it. Guys that know and trust the process, and actually, I know them. Um, yeah. New bands, if it's the right band, I enjoy it. But you know, the the one bad thing that's always been about producing bands is you could produce an album for a band, put your heart, and your soul into it, write the stuff with them, do everything, make the best record in the world. And the band could be in between agents, do a showcase for the agent. The record company's there. And in the middle of the set, the singer's drunk and tells the, the president of the record company to go screw himself. And now your record's over. Right. And so That sounds familiar, like, Sean. I don't I <laughs> He's not talking about me, I do It no, sounds super familiar. Music, but when I do library music and I do my own thing, if people love it, it's because they love what I do. If people hate it, it's because they hate what I do. Like, I'm cool with that because at least it's in my control. I love you your know? passion. I love your passion for it, bro. Like, you get, like, little kid excited about it. And I, I think that's, like, what art's about, you know? Totally. Constructive criticism, you know. Take it what you will. Yeah, dude, that's fucking awesome. Yeah. So that's, that's the thing about producing records that has always sucked. That once you've done with the record, you that's it. You did, you did what you had. You handed it off. And... The record label does what the record label does. The band decides to break up right after you finish the record. I mean, you name it. Yeah, there's a lot out of your control. I mean, it's it's uh, and and it's a very volatile world with bands and labels and managers and shit like that. Yeah, and it, it, you know, the success of the record really isn't directly correlated to how much work and love you put into it, or even how good the record is. Sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still think Conscious is one of the, my favorite, one of the best records I ever produced. And it's like, what did that sell? You know what I mean? I know. I know. It's it's crazy. It's it's all about, I mean, it's, it's all about the bank account behind it at this point in time. Yeah. It, it's amazing because, you know, with uh, like Consciousness as, as a good example, is so much better of a record than our first record was. But our first record was pushed so hard by the record company. I mean, millions and millions of dollars went into it. And people still will, will comment things like, oh, your first record's your best record. And I'll say, well, have you listened to all of our records? And then it usually goes quiet. And it, it's just it's just proof that people are, you know, prone to like the things that are just repetitively shoved down their throats. They equate oh, yeah, that I with mean- quality, you know? Marketing is everything. And dude, I've had some of your more super fans actually get mad at me when I've held those, those, uh, you know, shapeshifter plaques. It's like, yo, you just made a, a bad cover record. It's like, well, really, not really dude, just did it with the band. <laughs> it's not like it's me playing music. <laughs> yeah, for, yeah, Sean told me the other day to the shapeshifter record. That was, that was a good album, man. Like, awesome. It, it, so so you've had our fans lash out at you about that? Not that many of them, but a few of them. Like, if you look at the comments when I'm holding some of your plaques for those songs, right. look at look at a couple of comments here and there. Be like, the original version's much better, dude. You just made a cheap <laughs> cover. Like, not, <laughs> you know, if there's like 100 comments, like maybe se- seven or eight of them are like negative comments. If I leave them up there, too, I'm like, you know, something, whatever. It's his opinion. I'm cool with that. I don't care. Yeah, because the bottom line is that they wouldn't be li- they wouldn't be listening to the song on the- they wouldn't be listening to Bob Bottle on Spotify if we didn't make that record. Absolutely, they wouldn't be listening to any of those songs. We that's why we made those songs. But it's funny just because the internet is just such a cesspool of negativity. It doesn't matter what you do, dude. You're not going to please everybody. There's always somebody just you know miserable in their own lives and having accomplished shit just so ready to tell people that are actually doing things and putting something out there putting themselves out there that what they do sucks dude 100 man well, i think yeah. that a lot of people too especially with your music more than a lot of artists i work with people hold it very close to them because you're like describing their lives so they they get personally offended when you mess with <coughs> their music it's not your music it's their music Right. So, I mean, 
you you could tell somebody you remastered and they'd be like, dude, the original was better. It's like I'm lying. I was just kidding. And they'll still be like, no, the original's better. <laughs> it's just You're right. Of, and I understand that. I'm cool with that. You know, whatever. It's a no, psychological thing. Oh, sorry. sorry, why, Anthony? No, I miss, I miss people arguing about music instead of like politics and everything else. You know, I, I miss like the music argument. You know, it, the the music yeah. argument is still there. It's just it's just in the background compared to the 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 political commentary of of our of our current world. You know. Yeah, I remember when people used to argue about Black Sabbath with Ozzy or Dio. Like that's what we were worried about. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now the world's just crumbling around you, and there's there's bigger, important, more important things to bitch about, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Gabe, live Sabbath. So, so how did it? How did this new thing, this uh, new band that you're working with, how did that come about, Eddie? We just, um, you know, I always try to put some people together that maybe be an interesting thing. And Billy, I produced Billy's record like twenty something years ago. And we lost touch for a while and we became friends. And I was like, you know, Billy was in town one day. And I was like, man, it'd be really cool to put Billy and Brett together. Like, like Billy probably barely knew who Fuel was because it's not, that's not what he listens to. You know what I mean? So, yeah. and, you know, and obviously Brett didn't know who Billy was. So we put this together and Billy's playing all these like real like Texas blues riffs. And then we just started writing melodies and, you know, we all, sort of well i was already friends with both of them but they became pretty good friends and then billy right after we had the first two songs billy moved to nashville so then it was like we just sat on those songs for a couple of years and forgot about the whole project and then right around when the pandemic started brett's like you know those songs are really good why don't we write some more with billy so during the pandemic you know we were like ah who cares so brett would come over anyway and we do zoom with billy and it's pretty cool because billy would play a really sick riff and then put it in the Dropbox I'd immediately take it out and put it into a session he'd be like oh, I got another riff too and he'd be like on an iPad Billy on Zoom write another <laughs> riff put it in the Dropbox and pull it out and I'd arrange the song really quick while we're all sitting there and then send it back to Billy then Billy would put an overdub on it Brett would take the guitar track bring it back to his house play drums on it and bass bring it back to me and then we cut the vocals in my place so I'd mix it and the thing about Billy that's pretty sick is that when Billy plays those original tracks when we're writing the song, he's such a vibe player that those will be the tracks. Right. Like he's one of those guys that plays this really cool riff and never plays it exactly the way he plays it, not because of the notes. He knows what notes he plays, but there's a feel and a vibe that when right. he's writing something, he has. So we always have him record his riff to a click track right from day one. Yeah. So when you hear our record, 90% of it is the guitar when he was writing the riff. That's great. He just has that magic touch on the first the first uh, intuitional playthrough, huh? He, he's just, he's one of those guys. You see, he's a really, really like, I don't know how to explain him, like Clapton type of like bluesy player. He plays with uh, the guys, the band from, um, what's that TV show? Uh, Sons of Manakee. See, they're called, uh, I forgot what the band's called, but he, he plays with them. Um, I mean, but he's played, he was in the Austin club scene for a while. He's played with everybody from like Double Trouble to like, like that whole, like he's, he's really a sick player and he's got a, you know, made a good name for himself in Nashville. That's awesome. It sounds like he, he picked the right town to move to these for uh, music these days. Yeah. I think he, you know, he was, he was living in Chicago lived in Austin for a long time. He was in a metal band called Flame in like the 90s that was signed to, I don't remember who, but, uh, and that was more of like a, a 90s band, like a rock band. And I met him, I produced him in like 1999, 2000, became a singer songwriter. And my buddy who actually discovered Primer 55 and Cara Diaguardi and all those other people I produced, um, discovered him. And we made a record for him. They shopped it for a deal. Jonathan Daniels was man was shopping with us at the time, who later became a huge legendary manager. So it was me and Jonathan and Billy Harvey were shopping. And uh, Island almost signed him, but uh, it never happened. And then he made indie records for years. I don't even know how many indie records he's got at this point. 
but uh, it's cool. It's, it's a cool mixture of <laughs> different things. The solos, he's, he's like a real solo, like blues solo player, too. So yeah. A lot of cool solos on the record, cool, like old school riffs, classic rock riffs. But you know, uh, also I'm look I'm looking forward to hearing the record. I don't I don't think I've heard almost anything from that. No, we haven't put anything out yet. Yeah, but so yeah, it's I mean, great though. The the cool thing about it, we weren't trying to write hits, we weren't trying to write singles, we were just trying to write songs that maybe we could see on the TV show and really just having fun. Like, yeah, it wasn't like oh we can't do this. Oh that where's the single? Like, we we weren't writing it like that. Yeah, so that's how the best stuff comes out sometimes when you're not going for commercial radio success. You know, it's it's uh yeah. And, until we started getting a lot of songs together, and Brett was like really trying to decide like what he wanted to do as an artist. He's like, dude, I want I want to put everything into this. Like, like I want I, this should be a real band. Like, let's tour. Let's. You know, then we started shopping around for record deals and you know the booking agent and. Like, I don't want to tour in my life because I, I like the way my life is. And I, I don't really love touring or playing live. But I was like, yeah, if we have an interesting, interesting gig, I mean, they're two really good friends of mine. Like, I'll do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be fun. It'd definitely be fun did, for a did, short amount of time. One of the listeners just, uh, just said that you worked with Roger Daltrey and asked how that was. Is that true? Yeah. But Roger Daltrey guested on an Anthrax record. And he sent in his track from England. So Scott Ian oh, okay. was in the room with Roger Daltrey. I wasn't in the room with him, but he sang on, I think it's called Taking the Music Back cool. on the Anthrax record. I produced called We Come For You All. Uh -huh. But he sent us like 20 tracks of him singing the part. So I have like outtakes of him singing that you're like, wow, that's Roger Daltrey. And some tracks like, wow, that's Roger Daltrey. So it's pretty cool. The good and the bad and the ugly, huh? Yeah. I don't I don't think most people out there realize the vocal yeah. the, the process to get that vocal that lead vocal line, you know. Yeah, plus you know Dimebag played on that record too and that was another one Dimebag track in Texas and sent us a solo with and without effects. And it's funny cuz when Dimebag puts the effects on his vocal, you're like that's Dimebag. Like it's right. unrecognized like it's un undeniably Dimebag. Without the yeah. effects on it, he sounds like Dimebag, but not like when he when he said, you know, we were like, let's use the one with the effects. But what's really cool is that he was leaving a series of answering machines on my answering machine at the studio. And one of them is the beginning of the song Cadillac Rock Box, which was actually an answering machine message. When he got the song, he's like, got some mighty fine grooving going on that Cadillac Rock Box. Like, and we mic my answering machine at the time. It's like one of those tape ones. And that's the intro to that song. It's him talking. Awesome. I have other. He left a bunch of messages on my answering machine. But it's pretty funny that we did use that one for the intro of the song because it's cool. That's great, man. That you've had some legendary uh, guest stars on some of the records you, you produced. Wasn't uh, Bruce Springsteen on the Jesse Mallon record? Bruce Springsteen um, sang and played guitar on the Jesse Mallon record, and is in the video for the song "Broken Radio." The funny thing about that is the day that we were supposed to be at Bruce Springsteen's house cutting the record was the same day that my first son was supposed to be born. So I had a choice to make. Go to Springsteen's house and cut Springsteen or go to the hospital with my wife and have my first son. So, so you went I to went Springsteen's, to right? I went, I, went to, yeah. I went to the hospital and Caggiano, who was my partner at the time, felt bad that I wasn't there. So he tried to record some on his phone and they caught him. And the engineer's like, dude, if you record anything else, you're going to throw you out of the session. So I, I didn't, you know, I, I mean, you know, didn't, I didn't get to that session, unfortunately. Right. That's, that's still a classic story, man. What are the odds? Your, your son or, or, or doing that? Yep. And it was crazy because I, I walked out of the hospital to take a break. And it was like Saturday. And Shivari was on the phone for Nino. He's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm in the hospital. My, my wife just had a baby. He's like, oh, yeah, so did LaRue's wife. He goes, you got to be in the studio on Monday. I was like, what studio? What are you talking about? He goes, we're going to be in town on Monday. Didn't I tell you? We're going to make a record. You got to be in the studio. I was like, I'm not going to be in the studio. He's like, yeah, you got to be in the studio. 
I said, well, I'll go into the studio for three hours for the first couple of days and just get you ready because what's his name was recording Andy, uh, Andy, John, uh, Andy Johns. So it's like he was a legendary guy, engineered like Zeppelin and the Stones and all these things. He was engineering the record. So I'm like, okay, why don't I just go there and do pre-production with you? So the so literally Monday when I got out of the hospital, I went and did uh, the El Nino record. And then my wife, being the rock star she is, Monday, she gets out of the hospital and she goes and does Kelly Osbourne's makeup. And Kelly Osbourne's like, aren't you going to give birth any day now? And she's like, oh, yeah, I had a baby two days ago. <laughs> Kelly Osbourne's like, what the hell are you doing here? So. <laughs> that's that's pretty classic, man. I can't believe she was uh, working a couple days. I mean, it's one thing for you to work a couple days after, but her. Kelly Osbourne needs to make up people like <laughs> What's that? Oh, I was just saying no, that uh, for for you to go to go work a couple of days later is one thing, but for your wife to go, that's that's a whole other ball game right there. She had to push a fucking baby out. Yep, I know. She's, I know. My wife awesome. wasn't doing anything after my daughter was born for quite a while. Yeah, no, she she went right out there. But she always jokes with our kids. She's like, if I could have a baby and go to work, like you'd go get a job somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> That sounds like some shit my mom would say. It's a woman thing. Yeah. So, so Eddie, how's the uh, Eddie's? Eddie's a big pizza connoisseur, being from New York, and and he educated me as to all of the ins and outs of good pizza. How's the pizza scene doing in LA these days? Well, good. Well, Grimaldi's like LA here, so we don't have that anymore. Oh, really? Remember we went there in El Segundo. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, so that that's gone. But you know, honestly, there's a lot of good pizza in the valley now. Like really? they have this place, Gorilla Pies. It's an ex Nobu chef that's got a real cool spin on pizza. Um, there's a lot of places now. Like you would like literally like a half dozen pizza places that are great that deliver to my house. Awesome. So they really they really upped the pizza game. I remember when I first moved to LA, like I went to a pizza place that looked cool. I got a slice of pizza. I took one bite. I'm like, can I get this to go? And they put it in the box, literally walked outside. As soon as I got away from the restaurant, threw the box right in the garbage. It's just, <laughs> there was bad pizza in LA. They, they, well, majorly, you, you... they majorly upped the pizza game up here, out here. And the Italian food in general has come a long way in LA. Are, are you still uh, ordering from Marcelino's ever? Or is that out of the question now? Yeah, no, we still do. Especially when Brett's here. Because Brett, he Brett's still, his, <laughs> his favorite is still the Marcelino's with the sausage and pepperoni. That's a good pie, dude. I I definitely I definitely miss uh, some of those food spots that we used to hit from your place. Or they used to deliver from your place, should I say. A Eddie, Eddie. Well, funny. Ord Marcelino's moved. Like, they still live in my house, but they're like, like about 10 blocks away now. But it's funny, my new house that I have now. Is literally in walking distance from where the old Marcelino's was. Oh man! Like it's a shame just, that they moved. You just walked over and got slices. You just missed it. it you, so. It's it's funny because Eddie Eddie is he works so much. You know he's always in his studio in his house just just making tracks. And uh, there's all these food places you know in the valley in California there that deliver. And uh, he would order from certain places so often. I remember there's a sushi place that used to deliver to his house, but then they stopped delivering. But then he'd have me call and be like, oh, tell him, tell him it's for Eddie. Cause I'd answer. I'd be like, Hey, I, I need an order for a delivery. He'd be like we don't deliver anymore. And I'd be like, it's for Eddie. And they'd be like, Oh, okay. And they would just <laughs> deliver to Eddie's house. Yeah, the owner used to drive the food over the house. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're their number one customer. That's for sure. Plus the Indian place. Remember the Indian place here? It burnt down, but. Oh, it place. did. Oh yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, that's one a shame. That place was awesome. That place was great, right? I don't think yeah. an Indian place hasn't come along that's been better than that. It's a shame. That was the best best Indian food around here. Yeah, yeah, that was good. What about uh, Carnival? Is that still around? Oh, yeah, we get Carnival all the time. I mean, that place is going to be there forever. I mean, that, that, that's like an institution. I, I, I mean, I can't imagine that going away. 
But you know, now yeah, with Postmates and everything, I mean, everybody delivers to the house. We get Carnival delivered all the time. You get what delivered? Carnival. Oh, Carnival. <clears throat> yeah, I, I miss that place, man. I Where I live in Arkansas, we, we, we've got some great restaurants, but we don't have anything covering the Lebanese Mediterranean, you know, anywhere near that level. Yeah, that's probably not like falafel and stuff's probably not the thing where you are. No. No. I eat like Greek food like probably every day for long. Yeah, I, I eat like this, this place called Michael's on the street. It's a like Greek food. And they have like, the best hot wings and stuff, man. I, I eat there like every day, probably. Like, every single day for lunch. Yeah, it does seem there's like some... you eat there every single day. I do. I'm there's just saying, great... I eat there every day. But Carnival is like Lebanese, though. It's, it's, it's a little different. Yeah, I'm, Leb- I'm part Lebanese. This one, I, I like their food a little bit too. Indian, Indian food's good too, like you say. I like Indian food a lot. I like I like Vietnamese food the best though. But like, Vietnamese food is my favorite. Like out of any food, I think out of any culture food, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. Eddie's a, Eddie's in a great little little spot for restaurants in general. I, I definitely that's one of the things I miss about California is just the food availability and quality or? and and variety. There is a lot of food. Though. Are you downtown then, or where where are you at? Uh, like in California, like downtown. Oh, uh, Sherman where? Oaks. I'm in the, oh, okay. in the valley, but. Where I am, I mean, literally, we'll order Postmates from Hollywood. We've ordered Postmates from Beverly Hills. Like, a lot of those places, like, they'll come out. So you can get, like, you know, you can get food from anywhere. But you wouldn't even recognize, Sean, if if, if you saw Ventura Boulevard's like now, you wouldn't even recognize them. I mean, they have, like, like I don't know if you've been to Katana on Sunset, but they have, like, a Katana-style sushi place that one of our friend zones that's like five minutes to the house where they'll have like a lamb chop and steak on a skewer and sushi. Damn. It's got like the grill. Mm. You know what I mean? It's not just a yeah. sushi. But like they have like real um like very like West Side Hollywood type of restaurants here. They have like a good vibe inside and like it's not like like when I first moved to the valley, like all the restaurants were like ready for your grandma, you know? Yeah. They were very like early bird special type of restaurants you know now like they've really like done it up here like there's they got the sportsman's lodge over they got sugar fish in there now and like they've really done it up you know i'm sure man california is just so so rapidly changing i mean you know having moved away and then going back to visit only here and there it's like every time i go back it's it's almost unrecognizable yeah I was thinking about getting a tent down there, like moving in. Yeah, there's a lot right a couple blocks from my house. I could, I could, I could show you a good spot. <laughs> yeah, if you if you have any realtor friends, yeah, I'd love to get a, I'd love to get a, good, especially good one right next to a school because that's where all the drug dealers are. Perfect. Perfect. Right next to uh, one of your kids' school. <laughs> well, I, I I told you I, I was, I was like literally 200 feet from my my kids' school on a major intersection at 8:30 in the morning. And I look over, and there's a guy um, naked taking a poop in a garbage can, sitting on the garbage <laughs> can pooping, <laughs> right on the corner. That's the mascot, dog. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm gonna write. A, I'm gonna write a. I'm gonna write a, an email to the mayor and suggest that she starts putting toilet paper holders on the garbage cans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I don't miss that. I don't miss that about California. St. Louis is just as bad. Are you be on the Metro Line? Kids are just selling drugs in front of you and shit. It's just like, it's like, like, and like not like weed, like actual drugs. It's just like, it's just weird as fuck. It's like, I don't know. Very, you always watch your back and stay with your Well, you know what? The fun part is now you go like you go to where all the RVs are, and you'll see like forty like RVs that are broken down and one nice BMW right in the middle, and you're like, hmm, wonder what's going on there. Huh. Someday yeah, the cops will catch on to that. What's that? Someday the cops will catch on to that. Like, what's the guy doing in the high end BMW with like the 40 RVs that are all like full of garbage and homeless people? Hmm, I wonder why the BMW's there. I don't th- could you can the cops even do anything anymore? It no, like it's they're... illegal. It's legal to um it's legal to sell drugs and it's legal to outwardly do drugs. I was yeah. I picked up my twelve year old from school today, and I looked over twenty feet away, and there was the guy that was there this morning too with a needle, right in this thing. Like, 
20 feet That's away. That's probably a vaccine, him. though, bro. He's, he's probably getting <laughs> vaccinated. It's, it's just self, self-vaccinating, self right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was. He had a mask on, too. He's being very sick. It was the Moderna. It's the Moderna. The Moderna. <laughs> yeah, I got it. it was. He's had a Pfizer. I can tell because he had a Pfizer hat on. <laughs> Pfizer hat on. <laughs> he's being very safe. I was going to call the cops on him, but once he had the mask on, I'm like, you know, he's He's, he's good. Fine. He's, he's vaccinated. He's good. Yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. Yeah. He was, it was a booster shot. Yeah. You're right. It was a booster. Yeah. So, so, so how do uh, Eddie and Luke handle handle that kind of environment? Are they are they pretty like I'm like uh, immune to it? I'm terrified. Huh? I I took my kid to go play golf the other day, and I'm coming back, and I'm stuck in traffic right by the house, and there's this homeless guy with two bottles of open beer sitting on people's hoods and trying to get him to drink beer. And then getting off the hood and getting on the next hood and trying to get him to drink beer. And I'm like, well, this guy's heading towards my car. And he's going to sit on my hood and try to get me to drink a 40 with him. And I don't know what I'm going to do about that. But luckily, the guy next to me must have had a broken window because the window was down. So the guy, like, literally was putting the beers in the guy's car. And there was enough happening that I could pull in front of him. And he kept going back down. But literally, like, jumping on people's hoods and then... <laughs> Sliding down to the windshield and trying to hand them beer, like, cool. At least he's got a. At least he's yeah, got a product. Like, fuck. Yeah, you know, I, I'm into the. He's got something to offer. Yeah, I'm into the entrepreneurship. But like, I don't know how many times I've been at like a bus stop and like, I have money. I'm like, if you sold me coffee, you know what I mean it's just like, what are you doing? Like, like just sell me something. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like a customer. You know. Yeah. Like my, my kid, like my kid, where we live now, we bought my kid a bird scooter, like his own bird scooter. So he was nice. going to the store to buy a computer cable. Like you can actually drive through the back part of my neighborhood and come out on the main street without going on the main street. So it's like it's really cool actually where I live now. How and much he are said those that he went hedges, And when he looked over, there was a homeless guy eating an actual rat. Dude, oh god! It's hard. So how much? How much is a wine scooter? I feel so horrible for these people. But I wish the money that was put to them by by these nonprofits. I wish it actually got to them because it's so sad. It's it's actually said there was a naked woman that was walking. Walking around right outside my kid's school that we see every day. And a lot of times she'd stand in the middle of the street. Like an older woman, just almost completely naked. It's like, you feel bad. I hate when that happens. realize that this is happening to them. And I can't stand naked women. Look, What's I that? can't stand it. I can't stand seeing naked women either, man. It's like crazy. <laughs> well, this, this naked woman you want to see. But the whole thing is that <laughs> it's just sad because, you know, you think like these people have parents and like, you know, like. Like at one time they were a little baby with all the hope in the world. Like it's a horrible thing. Yeah. That's know, but real. That's and, real. and then our mayor gets, you know, one point three billion dollars and they start hiring this person and you're gonna head up the homeless department for five hundred and fifty thousand a year. And you're gonna head up the assistant homeless department for three hundred thousand dollars a year. And this money never gets to the people that need the money. So it's such an industrial complex. Why stop it? If you were making six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year on off of homeless people, are you gonna house them? Yeah, it's it's a it's a, a racket, man. We should feed them it's to the a hungry. Shame. It's sad. The, the people yeah. out here, yeah. like that, people treat animals better than people standing on the side of the road. Like I said, we joke about, it, we laugh about it. I feel horrible when I see people like that. Like I yeah, saw yes. this uh, this man yesterday at a bus stop. I saw this had to be a 70-year-old woman with a guitar and a cowboy hat on and a guy with a cowboy hat on and a little briefcase. Had to be in the 70s, just sitting at a bus stop like the world collapsed around them. And it did. They're like, it did. But it's like those people need, they need treatment. They need mental health. They need, but there's no money in that. Committing people, there's no money in that. There's who, how are you going to take money from that? So nobody wants to do anything about it. It's horrible. Dude, there's there's most certainly a mental health epidemic in our country, and I I, I see it, you know, I I, I mean I'm, I'm always touring, and I see it, you know, in Memphis, I see it in Albuquerque, I see it everywhere, you know, it's just uh, it's a shame what's what's become of our country. I think we have sixty thousand homeless people in LA County. 
I think I think California has like almost fifty percent of the entire nation's homeless at this point, right? It's I don't know, but like I do that. know that our mayor housed like a hundred people last week, and she was like happy. She only got fifty nine thousand something to go. Right. Right. Yeah, and the the hundred that she helped was a publicity stunt, you know, just to pat herself on the back and virtue signal and shit. And, and she probably, she probably housed and they're probably back out already because that's the problem yeah. like you know like i've always said if, if you want to like look when, when people are alcoholics they make them go through the 12-step program and you know they have to admit they have a problem you have you have to stop fooling yourself <laughs> you know if look god forbid you fall on hard times you lose your job you don't go get the tent and pitch the tent out in the road you either move somewhere or you find family or you get back on your feet it's sure housing is expensive we have multiple friends in LA that couldn't cut it here anymore financially. And they moved, they moved like Oklahoma. They moved, they don't just pitch a tent someplace. That's a mental health issue. That's yep. not a housing issue. You, know, yep. you see these people, if, if you look at street people of LA or any of the things, and you see these people on the subway, like ODing on fentanyl, they'd be doing that in their $800,000 condo that we're gonna give them. There wouldn't be, it's like all of a sudden you get a condo and now I don't do drugs anymore. It's like that's not the problem. Yeah, I mean, no, you're right. You're I'm absolutely sure right. A small percentage of people is the problem, but they need to they need to actually help people instead of trying to steal all their money. Yep. Yep. But you know, what are it's, you gonna do? It's a t- it's a terrible thing, man. It really so is. So anyway, back, back to uh, more positive topics <laughs> here. You said you're working with a, a another band right now. Uh, you said called Versus. Mm-hmm. How, how did that yeah, it's come actually, along? It's, it's Steve Esquivel from Skin Lab. Um, and it's this, this singer, um, JD from Van Called Failure Anthem. Like, it's it's great. The music's great. So we're just in pre-production right now where they have a few songs demoed and then they have 12 songs on a record that they've already sort of done, but with a different singer. But they it's their record. So we've been going through those songs and seeing what we can turn into this. And then um, probably in about three weeks, the singer is going to come up from Louisiana and sing on the songs we're doing pre-production on Zoom. And then uh, they're going to start shopping it. And but how really did that come about up? The were, were, you, were you like friends with all those guys to start with? Or how did that come about for you? I met I met Steve Esquivel when he guessed the 36 Crazy Fits record literally 20 years ago. Oh, wow. And then he made a Skin Lab record that we used to have our imprint on Roadrunner, Scrap 60. I wanted to sign that record so bad. I think it came out on Century Media eventually. But I wanted to sign the record. I couldn't get traction at the label. They just didn't want to do it. So Rob and I were hanging with Steve a lot, trying to get that record so, you know, on Roadrunner. And then I lost touch with them for years. And then I started working with this guy, Adam, from this band Dope Sick. He just put out a single called Take Me. It just came out now. I work with Adam like a single here, a single there. You know, um, we're about to do another single for him in a couple of weeks. Great stuff. Great. And he was in Skin Lab for a little while. And he was also in um, Sebastian Bach's band. So um, Adam and Steve must have been talking and they were looking for somebody to really become like you know co-writer and a you know producer with them and i heard the first four demos i'm like this stuff is great like i i want to do this so awesome. i'm really psyched about it i mean you know really cool i'm excited to hear it's that man hard rock you know in the same world as like you know bring me the horizon and asking alexandria and i prevail you know it's it's i guess at this point what you call commercial metal i mean i don't i don't know what you call it now yeah, the the modern popular kind of heavy. It's heavy in that rock world, music. but it's not really any anything specifically like any of those bands. But it's, they would play a gig with those bands, you know. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah. It's I'm versus excited to hear. like V I R S S I S. Oh, okay. So it's spelled very all. At least now, I don't know if that's going to change. Well, that'll help them be found on the internet. That's for sure. Yeah. With a with a name like Versus, if they just spelled it regularly, good luck with that. You know. Yeah. You got to stand out. But yeah, so that you know, 
So I'm sort of in pre-production with that right now. Um, I'm working with the singer-songwriter, this girl Alexandra, really cool, like, folk singer-songwriter. I really don't take on that many artist projects because there's, they're just, there's not as much place you can go with them nowadays. It's just not like, it's not like the old days. And like I said, there's so many outside factors. Like, as a producer, like, that's all I am. It's like, I don't, I don't know who they're going to get for the distribution. I don't know how much they're going to push their own record. I don't know how much they're going to tour. Yeah. Like it just, you know, there's only so many hours in the day. And if I can make music that I know is going to end up in the NFL, like, you know, yeah, dude, you, you gotta, you gotta do what you can control and what you can make the, the best money on. I mean, the, the, the money has definitely gone away from rock music and, and into other things. So it's like, you gotta yeah, go for I, the I, really enjoy, I enjoy doing the licensing stuff. I enjoy sitting by myself in a room and writing music. Like, you know, I mean, I enjoy writing music with other people too, but you know, it was always more about, I, I learned how to play keyboards so I could write music, not because I just love playing keyboards. Yeah. You I know? hear you, man. That was always the end goal. to so write music. Yep. Still doing it after all these years. Yep. Definitely. Definitely been a good ride so far. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, I'm thinking about doing a uh, something else towards the end of the year, so I'll have to hit you up and see if you're available to mix a couple tunes. Yeah, always. I had fun with the last batch. That was cool. Yeah, you killed it on the on uh, the loss of everything. sounded sounded awesome. Yeah, I like mix, especially in my new studio. My new studio is so like set up to mix. Like the very this studio is very properly treated. I have a cool ISO room. You know, the cutting vocals and I've been cutting violin in there lately, which is cool too. Oh, awesome. You know, like, like literally cut vocals now and I don't have to wear headphones anymore. Like, I'm in my, my room, you know? Yeah. That's great. It's pretty yeah, cool. I got to have I, the vocal booth. I can control my keyboard, my computer from my vocal booth. So I could always, not that I do, but I could put a drum set in my control room and cut in the vocal booth. Really? Mm hmm. Nice. Have you actually done that? that? What's that? Have you done that? No, but I'm wired for it. But yeah. now I, it was easy to just do, to put a USB in my monitor in the control room. So, you know, I it's not. That's why I didn't really worry about a drum room because I cut drums so few times. Yeah. But I wanted to be able to just like that one time in five years. Someone's like, "We make up a drum set." So, so when you guys made the Melody Brothers record, uh, you said that Brett played all the drums on that, huh? Brett played the drums in his house. <laughs> That's awesome, dude. I Brett, didn't realize. I, mean, I remember him playing the drums up. a little bit, but he's Sorry, pretty what? good. He's pretty good. Well, he's he's got a drum set in there. I lent him a little gear too, and it's mic'd up all the time. So literally, right. he like went nuts getting like the perfect mic position on everything. So when he cuts the drums. He literally, it's all ready to go. Like, he just, you know, and the, they've got really good drum sounds on the stuff. That's awesome. That, that makes it easier for you, too. I mean, you can just cut that and send it over to you, and you, you just run with it, huh? Yeah, plus, the way Brett has the studio set up in his house, he's got, like, his wall of amps, and he can yeah. switch cabinets and all in the garage. So we're using, like, real guitar amps on stuff, too. And, you know, and then Billy's got a really nice studio in Nashville. He's got all kinds of like boutique crazy stuff. He got like the cigar box guitars and all, you know what I mean? Yeah. He's got like old whirlies. So all the Wurlitzer that he's playing, it's like a real Wurlitzer he's playing on. You get, you guys are doing it, doing it authentically, huh? Yeah, no, it's cool. Brett, Brett's always been a purist. He's, a, he's always been the guy that, that wants to, set up a million different amps and cabs and, and uh, compare the tones. and. I, don't yeah, he's he's... Got, I mean, he's got a good assortment of guitar emulators now that he's got dialed in, too. So he's, 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 he's come a long, a long way with that. You know, yeah. he's, he's pretty good on the computer now, too, programming. Like, like, he'll cut the drum tracks and edit them all himself and put in all the samples and everything, bring it to my house, and I'll fine-tune them sometimes. But he's he like is doing more editing than I am on the stuff. 
that's great for you. Yeah, I mean, that's the way we did it on Dropbox. Like, a lot of times he'll send me a text and be like, hey, I just cut the drums, send me a two-track of the drums. Billy and I will listen to them, see if we like them. And then I'll look in the Dropbox and have mold these are the, the drums. And be like, yeah, I threw a couple of guitars in there, too. Yeah, I just put them into a session, you know, and then tweak them a little bit. He always comes here to sing, though. We do the vocals together here. Yeah. You know, because we write all the lyrics between the three of us. And then, you know, Brett likes coming here and cut the vocals in the booth and everything. That's awesome, man. But yeah, we have 18 songs. Wow. So are you are you releasing only uh, half of the songs as as a record and then doing the other half as, as licensing? Is that what you were saying earlier? No, because we were just writing what we're writing. So we'll probably do five on the Desert album, five on the Concrete record. And then when we release all the singles, put them like back to back on maybe a vinyl or something. The desert on one side, concrete on the other. And then oh, okay. we'll still have eight songs left over for like a second record unless we write new ones. You know, like I said, we're just writing songs. Like someone will be like putting the group text, hey, got a new song idea. So be like, okay, you free on Tuesday. And then Tuesday we'll get on Zoom and play the new song idea. And then that's a new song. So it's not like we said, oh, we need 18 songs. We just ended up with 18 songs because we can. Yeah. Now, with with your guys' label, are with with the two sides, like you were saying, like almost like two EPs. Are you, are you going to release those uh, at the same time, or are you going to release like one EP and then another EP? Well, we're, we're you know we're doing what everybody else is doing is we're doing a single thing, and the yeah. first the first single is probably going to be a song that's somewhere in between. Like we have some songs that are sort of in between desert and concrete. They're not like. Some songs are very desert and very concrete. And some songs right. are sort of in the middle. Like, you're like, yeah, I'm not sure which record. So we're going to start with those. And then, you know, Billy sings lead, too. Billy's got a great lead vocal voice. So well, I think we're going to first go with the singles that Brett's singing on. Because yeah. not to confuse, like, what the band is. It's like what we did in World Fire again. I mean, I think you sang as many songs as he did. There were definitely, there was definitely, you know, portions of each. I mean, I think, I think he's saying a little more than me. I was trying to get out of, out of the vocal thing a little bit, but uh, yeah, we definitely both did some singing. But they're cool. Like the songs, like, like take me away where you would sing like the verse and he would sing the chorus and yeah. Yeah. That, that stuff was really cool. Where you guys would switch back and forth. It's like one sound, you know? Yep. Yeah. That, that really is cool. A great record. I just listened to it the other day, actually. My son, Luca, like, loves it. Oh, really? Yeah, and we were talking about, I forgot who it was, but I was playing somebody, Caggiano solo in Never Saw the Wall. Yeah. He plays a really sick solo in that song. I don't know if you remember it. I mean, I can't remember it off the top of my head, but I remember digging the solos that he contributed and the, the Mike McCready solo. That they're, they're all nice little touches, you know? Yeah. Yeah, that record, like, got to figure out a way to, to get that thing in, on iTunes and Spotify, like, back into the world, because it's a shame that you can only listen to some of the songs, like, on YouTube or something. I know. Yeah, it would be nice to get it back. And I got a, I, I've developed a relationship with a, a record company that um, only does limited edition vinyl. And uh, I, I bet that he would be interested in releasing that on vinyl if, if ever given the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, look, we have physically have the masters. I'm just not sure if like, like I tried to put them up on SoundCloud that one time and it said I didn't have the permission to do it. So I had to request permission. I'm like, how is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I should talk to my guy about it. I, I wonder if, I mean, I, I doubt that he would be hesitant to release it knowing that it, that it really is ours, you know? Yeah, just that, like, I'm just afraid that if we try to also put it on Spotify, they're going to say we don't have the right to... I don't know, but yeah, I will we'll, try to do it. So I don't know. We, we, we may not be able to release it digitally, but a, a, a short run of, of really cool vinyl would be pretty sweet. Yeah. I mean, I'm down for anything, you know. You know, I just put out an old record that I was part of on, on Spotify. Maybe, maybe we could... I don't know if we have a Spotify page. Maybe just as an experiment. If one of us sets up a Spotify and just put it on, 
distort kit. Let's see what happens. Worst thing that happens is tell us you can't do it. I, I definitely navigate those waters a lot. I could totally try for us if we wanted to, to give it a shot. Yeah, you know? yeah, I mean, you're probably way more knowledgeable about distribution than I am. Yeah, I could I could definitely give it a shot. That'd be kind of fun, too. If it, if it actually snuck through, it'd be great. Yeah, I mean, why not? The worst thing that happens is they'll tell us that, you know, we don't have permission to release it. I don't know. Yeah, that's the worst. I don't think it was ever on Spotify. I don't think so either. Right? Cause when, when, when did that record come out? 2008? Shit. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. No, it had to be later than that. I think it was like 2011 or something. So what was Spotify doing in 2011? <sighs> Just getting going. Yeah, so it might have it might have already come and gone before Spotify even was Spotify. Yeah. Can can you guys break down licensing like in layman's terms for me and everyone? Eddie would be good for that. What's that? Can you break down the way licensing works for musicians or any creative entity that you make? Um, well, I don't know where to start. Licensing would be, <laughs> let's just say you're doing it yourself. You had a song, and mm. let's say there's, to make it simple, a TV show that wants to use your song. They would license the use of your song for that specific instance. Now, or we had a World Fire Brigade record and we allowed a record label to sell it. All they could do was sell it. And we allowed another label to try to get it into movies and TV shows. And we signed a deal where they don't own the music. They just get the right to sell the music. And that's what we did with World Fire Brigade. They had the right to license it. They got the right to get licenses for the music. So you're allowing... Um, we allowed them to sell the record, but somehow somebody registered it like it was their assets, like it was their property. So, so they registered the songs as the copyrights. As far as like licensing goes for television and film, that's a different type of licensing. That's licensing for usages. We licensed World Fire Brigade for one company to sell, only to sell. They couldn't actually put it in film and television. We licensed it with another company for that, and their contract expired. We got free and clear out of that one. So it's not that contract that's the problem. It's the contract of the company that we licensed to sell the thing. Sticky, sticky. I don't know if that's explaining licensing. I, I don't know. It's such a big topic. I don't know. Yeah, to license, licensing is like when we, like, like we own, we're supposed to own the master. We own the recording. But when we license it out, we're allowed, we're like renting it out essentially, but, but retaining ownership. Yeah, it's like if you invented like a new spoon and you allowed other people to manufacture the spoon, but you still own the patent on the spoon. So that's our music. We that's own the good. World Fire Brigade record and the mask and everything. We just allowed other people to manufacture it and sell it. Gotcha. And didn't you say that the lawyer passed away? That handled The lawyer the... that got us into the deal passed yeah. away. He was getting hmm. us out of the deal when he passed away. So now nobody's getting us out of the deal. Because what happened is the people from the record label folded. So he had, to, he had to go deeper. You couldn't just call up the record label. There's nobody in the office anymore. So now you have to go to the parent companies and whoever acquired the assets of the record company that folded. But the whole thing is when you sign a traditional record label, the label usually owns the masters. Like if you sign the record deal with, that's why Sean couldn't release his masters because he didn't own them anymore. He had to re-record them. So what happens is if you get signed to Atlantic Records, you sign over your masters to the record label. They can do whatever they want with them. So we were in a position with this record label. We didn't have to sign over ownership for the masters. We kept the masters, and we just signed over the right for them to sell the master. But Bingo. whatever guy in that office that inputted it into the computer did it wrong. They imported it that they owned the masters, and we didn't find that out until – Five years after the record label was done. We found it out when we tried to release it ourselves. Yeah, good, time, good right. times in the record business. It said that we don't own the masters. You have to contact the people that own the masters. And we're like, 
we're the people that own the masters. And SoundCloud's like, no, you're not. That's the problem. Legal red tape. And, a mis- and what makes it even worse is it was a mistake. Yeah. Because if you look at our contract, it clearly says we signed like a one-page record contract. That's how simple it was. It says our band allows this record label to sell the master. That's it. We retain you know, actually, ownership of it. Actually, Eddie, now that you're saying that, um, do you still have a copy of that deal? Yeah, and so did Ian, but you have nobody to give it to. Well, okay, but here's the here's the thing, right? So if I try to digitally distribute that record through whatever, if, if there's a problem, what they would do is hit me back and say, you need to prove that you have ownership of this master. And I could submit the contract as that proof. It didn't work with SoundCloud. Oh, you tried that? Oh, shit. Yeah, I don't I know. Mean, who's to say we didn't just draw up a contract ourselves and, I mean... What makes the contract legit if there's nobody on the other side of it to say, oh, yeah, that's the contract. Why don't we just, why don't you and I just write a new contract tonight that says, we own our master forever and we'll just both sign it and then give it to Spotify. Well, okay, but uh, on that same note, when I have, I, there's been a couple records that I've uh, re-released or released where that happened and they they wanted proof and I, I submitted a contract as proof and that cleared it. So maybe we should just okay, try so that maybe diff- maybe SoundCloud is just a bad company when it comes to that. Maybe Spotify would be better. You might need some yet. face tattoos to negotiate with them. We definitely have a copy of our one-page contract. Yeah, that, let's let's you know when I get home from this tour, maybe we could uh, maybe we could powwow about you know making another attempt at that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. We can probably rip the artwork from. I don't know where the artwork is, but I, that we can figure that out. My my buddy Chris did the whole layout, so I could. He, I'm sure he still has that. I might still have it too, but that'd be great if we get at least the artwork. I mean, I'd love to get that on Spotify and iTunes. I mean, yeah. Whatever distribute, I don't know if you use DistroKid or what you use, but whatever it is, they put the stuff all over the place. You know. Yeah, exactly. That you you distribute through them, and then you just you know you can select the the stores you wanted to go to. But I I always just go with every fucking store in the universe so (laughs) me too i mean it's to me it's all about like i it's just such a good record it's just a shame that it's just like dead somewhere yeah i know dude i i I think about it every (laughs) every so often too and and then i'm just so busy and i I know you're busy brett's busy but let's readdress it for sure yeah i'd I'd love to get that out in the world so at least people can enjoy it you know absolutely absolutely so, Anthony, you got any more questions for Eddie? I know you said you have like 25 of them. I did. I was just listening to Legends talk to him, man. You guys had me entertained. I was just sitting back listening, man. Like, uh, like honestly, like, it's, just cool. it's just cool seeing them. I'm, I'm a fan of music, man. So I just, I just love seeing, like, it's not of it. And, like, I'm watching you being able to, man. Like, it's cool. Awesome. Very dude. cool. Well, we definitely appreciate you coming on, man. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, it's fun. Anytime, man. It's good times. Great catching I know up. You, I know you had said before that that you were thinking about an hour, and it's been an hour and twenty. Yeah. So hopefully, it hasn't been too terrible. No, that's okay. Yeah, I'm having a good time. Lost track of time. Yeah, when these go like two hours, I just picture like Cody just like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" He's <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like pulling up comments still. He's like, "Oh my god, I'm still here." Like, wait. His family's like tugging on his shirt and shit. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, yeah. That was only for the daytime show with Tommy Chung. I didn't have everybody's in bed now. There. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and at least I'm out here on the road. My daughter can't kick the door in and demand I make her food or some shit. <laughs> yep, that's the story of my life. I love it. Yeah, I my, got my my oldest son's like. Can you make me something? And I make him something, and then sit back down. And my younger son's like, "Can you make me dinner?" It's like, "Oh my god, I've been in the kitchen now for an hour and a half." Uh, kids, man. Kids. Like, man. I just like, order. I just, I just go to restaurants so I get my cook for me constantly. I'm just like, I'll, I'm like, I'll take this and just point at the best picture in the menu. I'm like, I'll take this one. That's how I eat. Gotta do what you gotta do. Well, yes, gentlemen. Sir. It's it's been it's been good. I, I should probably get going. 
Yeah, yeah. Thanks for coming on, Eddie. Like, uh, okay. thanks. thanks. Let thanks. me know anytime. Definitely, definitely. And thanks let's for watching. Cool. And let's definitely powwow about that record, Eddie. I think it's a good idea. I think we could maybe, maybe uh, get something going. Yeah, let's 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 get that happening. Cool. All right, gentlemen. Cool. I'll talk to you later. Cool. Sounds cool, good, yeah. guys.